Hello, I'm Larry Wilson, and welcome to the March 2007 broadcast. During our last segment, we ended our study in Revelation 13. We were investigating the composite beast, you know, the beast that rises out of the sea and makes war upon the saints for 42 months. So let's review a few things as we begin this study today on Revelation 13. Let's go to the computer screen and let's see what we need to recall. We need to remember that we are in the middle of a prophecy that chronologically began with Revelation 12 verse 7. You might, might recall that Revelation 13 is not the beginning of a new prophecy. It is the continuation, rather, of a prophecy that began in Revelation 12, 7. So we are studying a sequence of events that are in chronological order. And this is a crucial point. If the events given, listen carefully, if the events given in each apocalyptic prophecy, if they do not occur in the order given in the Bible, then who has authority to declare their order? How can prophecy be the more sure word of prophecy, as Peter calls it, when everyone is free to move the elements and parts around to suit their own conclusions. If anyone can move a prophetic element out of its place, out of its order, to suit their own ideas, then everyone has the same privilege. And this freedom, if in fact it does exist, makes prophecy a nose of wax. You know what I mean by a nose of wax? A nose that you can fashion and form to suit your own delight. <laughs> so if everyone has the same freedom of moving things around to suit his or her own ideas, this makes Bible prophecy a nose of wax, and this leads to a distortion of the intended meaning. Listen carefully. Again, I say, tampering with the order which God has given in apocalyptic prophecy robs the Word of God of its authority, its simplicity, and its great power. The Bible must speak, and it will speak for itself if we just allow it to do so. You know, at the end of the book of Revelation, the angel told John, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. Now, obviously, since the plagues described in this book occur at the end time, the application and the focus of this verse, these two verses, apply to the end time. This is not a condemnation of people who through the centuries have done their best trying to put the pieces together. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about people who deliberately and intentionally and willfully and knowingly try to add to or take away from what is said in the book of Revelation when the time comes for the message to be clearly presented. Verse 19, Revelation 22, 19. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. This verse is very interesting, these two verses, because they indicate that a time is coming when the book of Revelation will be clearly understood. As I said, during the Great Tribulation, this warning applies to any person who tries to divert or deflect 
the truth which the book of Revelation proclaims. When God's 144,000 prophets are empowered to proclaim his truth, anyone twisting the prophecies of Revelation to suit their own desires, to escape the truth which the 144,000 are proclaiming, such persons will be condemned to death. You should recall that the first verse in this prophecy, now we're going back to our examination of the prophecy we're in. The first verse of this prophecy began with verse 7 of Revelation 12, and that occurred on Resurrection Sunday when Lucifer was cast out of heaven on that very day, and we know that day to be April 9, A.D. 30. You should recall that Lucifer then chased the woman to the desert for 1,260 years. And then, chronologically, you should remember from last month's broadcast that near the end of the 1,260 years, the earth helped the woman. That's what the Bible says. And we know historically how that occurred in 1776, 22 years before the end of the 1,260 years. God raised up a Protestant nation, the United States of America, to accomplish a very important global task. And that task was the translation and distribution of the Bible and the worldwide promotion of the gospel, that salvation comes only through Jesus Christ and not through the church. If you remember our study on seals one through three, you will remember how the timing of all of this so wonderfully aligns. Let me draw a little picture for you just in, to help you understand how neat this is. I'm going to draw a timeline here. And this represents the 1260 years of persecution, the Dark Ages, and, um, you know, it started in 538, and it ended in 1798 with the fall of the papacy and the capture of the Pope during the French Revolution. Well, you recall, this is a study from Daniel 7, and also the first short prophecy in Revelation 12, where the dragon chases the woman to the wilderness for a time, times, and half a time, which is 1260 years. Now, in this longer prophecy, which began on Resurrection Sunday, that'll be back over here. So this is where Jesus, you know, is taken, goes up to heaven, and Lucifer then is cast out on Resurrection Sunday. I'll put a R-S, Resurrection Sunday. And then when the dragon saw that he's cast, he chases the woman for 1260 days, in this prophecy, a day being translated as a year because the Jubilee calendar is in operation. And so, as we get near the end, since 1776, just 22 years prior to 1798, the earth helps the woman, and a new continent, a new world is opened up that would become a Protestant nation. And out of this nation would come Bibles and missionaries into all the world. And this would set the stage up, as you recall, for the promotion of the gospel during the Great Tribulation. We're living right here where this X is. So here's the Great Tribulation right there. And you recall that in 1798, Jesus opened up the first seal. Then in the year 1800, the second seal. And then the third seal was in 1844. So these seals... And the story in Revelation 12 and the story in Daniel 7 all fit together with an incredible precision. Of course, I've made a very big mess on the little drawing here, but I hope you can see that all of these features come together in a, an amazing way. So when the woman, excuse me, when the devil saw that he could not destroy the woman in the desert, the Bible says the devil went off to prepare for war 
on the remnant of the woman. So basically, uh, what we have here is the devil's failure to destroy the woman in the desert. And so in 1798, when the empire, the Holy Roman Empire imploded, the devil lost his persecuting ability upon the saints, so he goes off to make war upon the remnant of the woman, those that keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And this is verse 17 in Revelation 12. Then in the next verse, chronologically, nothing is out of order. Things continue on without interruption. This should actually be verse 18, but the translators, when they put the chapter in number verses, uh, did not uh, arrange it that way. So, in Revelation 13, 1, John saw the devil standing on the shore of the sea, indicating that the devil is waiting for circumstances to arise, circumstances to come about, so that the composite beast could arise out of the sea. The devil's waiting for him. That's why the devil is standing on the shore of the sea. All right, when the composite beast rises up out of the sea, the devil will give this beast its great power, throne, and authority. Look at Revelation 13, 2. John writes, The beast I saw resembled a leopard. A leopard. Leopards are known for their cunning and their swiftness. Leopards are very clever creatures, very fast, very cunning. And this beast is a composite beast made up of several parts, and he resembled a leopard, but he had feet like those of a bear. I don't know if you've ever looked at bear claws, but the claws on this beast are as tough as chrome molybdenum or molly, chrome molly, as they call it for short. Molybdenum, when added to steel, makes the formest, excuse me, the strongest form of steel. It's the toughest steel that man can make. Molybdenum is an alloy, when added to steel, that makes it as tough as a bear claw. <laughs> and this composite beast has a mouth like that of a lion. What's so significant about the mouth of a lion? Well, the jaws of a lion are so powerful they can kill their prey with a single bite. Just one bite. That's it. This bear and like beast and this lion-like beast and this leopard-like beast is, are, these are the same animals found in Daniel 7. And we're really talking about the remnant of the empires of the world. And the dragon, the devil, gave the composite beast his power, his throne, and great authority. The great red dragon, when this beast arises out of the sea, the great red dragon will give the beast its power, its throne, and great authority. The composite beast will serve a dual purpose. First, from a human perspective, it will appear to be a necessary mediator between God and all mankind. And second, from Lucifer's point of view, it will enable him to prey upon the saints of God. Revelation 13:7 says, He, that is the composite beast, was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. And he was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Every nation, every tribe, every people, every language. So what on earth could create such a global monster? This composite beast is going to have authority over the Chinese. All 1.3 billion of them. 
It's going to have authority over the, the great continent of India, or the great uh, nation of India. Every tribe, people, language within India, all 1.1 billion Indians. It's going to have authority over Australia, over all of Europe, all of South America, and even the United States, Canada. Every tribe, people, language, and nation. So you ask, what on earth could create such a global monster? How would, what could possibly happen that would cause all nations, every nation, to cooperate and to submit their sovereignty to this monster? Well, the first four trumpet judgments described in Revelation 8 will produce death and destruction on a biblical scale that exceeds human measurement and calculation. I believe the first four trumpet judgments will occur during the first 30 to 60 days of the Great Tribulation. And because these judgments will be global in nature, the whole world will seriously question whether survival on planet Earth will continue. Get this, thousands of cities, thousands, not people here, thousands of cities will be destroyed. Earth's infrastructures will be in ruin, and 25% of Earth's 7 billion people will die as a result of these judgments. That means one and three quarters billion people dead. We just cannot conceive anything this huge, this large. That's one out of four. During these four calamitous events, the inhabitants of Earth will be traumatized by two painful observations. First, everyone will tremble at the reality of Almighty God and the power and scope of His fierce wrath. Everyone, the whole world, will tremble. Actually, Almighty God at the present time is Jesus Christ Himself. You may recall that Jesus took over the throne of God in 1798. He was found worthy in Revelation 5. But the world does not know that it's Jesus Christ who is now Almighty God and sitting on the throne. And mankind will not be, a made, uh, will not be made aware of Jesus' authority until the 144,000 begin their work of announcing his authority. And that's why I have shown in that study on the seals that the fourth seal is the revelation of Jesus Christ through his authority. Each seal, you know, is a greater revelation of Jesus, and the fourth seal is the revelation of his authority. And when the world beholds the destructive judgments of his wrath, whoa! That's going to change everyone's perception of Jesus Christ, I can assure you. And the icon that many people worship today and call Jesus is going to fade very quickly. The reality of Christ and the reality of who and all that Jesus is is very poorly understood. The second thing that everyone will notice about the first four trumpets is that God's judgments fell on cities and places that were widely known for wickedness. And when these two observations are synthesized together, most of the world will assume that more judgments from God are imminently forthcoming. In other words, four horrific judgments within a short span of 60 days will suggest that more judgments are imminently coming unless God is immediately appeased. And this fearful anticipation of more judgments from God will induce panic and this panic will propel the leaders of the world to rapidly and radically transform their governments. 
I rarely say anything profound, but listen to this. Desperate situations require desperate solutions. During the fourth trumpet, darkness will cover the middle third of our planet. That's where most people live, in the middle third of the Earth's sphere. And during this period of extended darkness, the crisis government will rise out of the sea. The beast will form. This crisis government is the composite beast of Revelation 13, rising up out of the sea. The need for one global entity to appease one God's anger will be obvious to most everyone surviving. With 1.75 billion people dead and thousands of cities lying in total ruin, intelligent people will suddenly wake up to the reality of God and man's accountability to him. And who will be able to argue against man's need to meet immediately appease God so that his judgments will cease. Therefore, the religious and political justification for the formation of a crisis government will be simple and unanimous. Everyone will agree. The whole world has to change its ways. The nations must unite and appease God through repentance and worship or everyone on earth will perish as a result of his wrath. Consider this. Jesus will turn the present governance of the world upside down with his first four trumpet judgments for a very good reason. Jesus intends to put the religious leaders, the religious experts of our world on display by catapulting them into the position of managing this global crisis until the devil arrives. In other words, the religious leaders of the world are going to manage this crisis for 890 days. God is going to put the religious experts on display. Do you remember how Jesus elegantly exposed the fraud of Nebuchadnezzar's religious leaders? Well, the same is going to take place in our day. Jesus wants everyone on earth to behold the horrible properties of false religion. And there is no better way to do this in a religiously diverse world than by putting religious leaders in charge of government. Political leaders will humbly submit to the advice and the direction of religious experts because religious leaders claim to be the experts on God. They claim to know the will and ways of the Almighty. And of course, billions of people trust in them. This will surely prove to be a case of the blind leading the blind. As I said earlier, when the fear of God's wrath has overtaken this world and hundreds of millions of people are dead, the political leaders of earth will humbly turn to the experts for instruction and direction. What should we do? This turning, this submission to religious leaders for answers will be a great opportunity for the Roman Catholic Church. The Pope will invite religious and political leaders from all over the world to a worldwide council. Three amazing decisions will come from this council that would otherwise be unthinkable. The first decision is that given the fact that there are many different religions, but there is one angry God, this council of diverse religious leaders will unanimously agree that all nations should unite as one man to appease God. This is how man's religious and political diversity is unified into the composite beast. Man agrees. We should unite as one man 
to appease one angry God. And this will create the composite beast. This union will only be possible because everyone will be afraid of God, and everyone will agree in principle that certain standards of righteousness should be imposed upon the whole world, or God will probably destroy everyone right away. Very important point here. Listen carefully. There are two principles upon which the diverse religions of the world can agree. Two principles. One, God requires repentance. Two, God requires worship. These two principles will be accepted by this council as the basis for world unity, and it means through which God is to be appeased. The second decision will be just as radical because God's anger was clearly directed at places that were well known for wickedness. Every nation will agree to immediately begin legislature, legislating sinless laws. Stop sinning so that the wrath of the Almighty might be appeased. Maybe man's efforts to live righteously will cause God to relent, they say, and maybe his judgments will cease if we turn from our wicked ways, as they did in Nineveh. Further, all nations will recognize in this special meeting called by the Pope that every nation must participate in appeasing God, or God's wrath will likely break out against the whole world once again. So here's the glue. Everyone has to participate, or God will still be angry with the world, and we will still be in trouble, and more judgments will fall on all of us. Therefore, the political leaders of every nation on earth will agree to abide by the directives of the crisis government, which will manage and mediate the current crisis between God and man. I hope you're beginning to understand how the composite beast forms. Now, I said some of these things in the previous seminar segment last month, but it's important that you get this very clear in your mind. And you've got, you have to hear it a couple of times in order to synthesize all the pieces of how this works and how it comes together, because God's Word is true. It can be trusted. It's going to happen. When we come back from the intermission, we're going to look at the third decision that will come out of this council meeting. May God bless you as you continue studying His Word is my prayer.